Hello. What does God do with a captive people held in Babylon? He tells them that they must accomplish something in order for them to return to their homes. Let's find out what that is. Let's turn in our Bibles to Jeremiah 29, 8-14. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you, that is in Babylon, deceive you, neither hearken unto your dreams which ye caused to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me. I will hearken unto you. So we know that the Israelites were in Babylon. They were there because they had been worshiping idols. They were no longer worshiping God. They were worshiping things of stone and of wood and of metals. They were going in their own direction, away from God. For God says, you'll have no other gods before me. You'll have no other idols. But they decided, no, we want idols. We don't need, because this represents God. They were walking in the sins of their own way. Then he, he continues and he says, for I know the thoughts toward you, Thoughts of peace, I want to save you, not of evil, to give you an expected end. I want you to be blessed. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken to you. When they realize their condition, that they're sinners, they want to repent. Please, God, help us. Then he says, You shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with how much? All of your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations, from all the places whither I have driven you. And I will bring you again into this place whence I have caused you to be carried away captive. Did that happen? Yes. God provided a way for them. He showed them that they could leave. They went back to to, uh, Israel, and there they put their city back together, and also their temple. So the question that we have now is, why did God do this? Why did God bring his family home? This is why. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. These people, these Jewish people that were in Babylon, had been attacked, destroyed, carried as slaves to this city. And now he is saying, okay, you've spent 70 years. Now you're prepared to understand why I had to do this. I had to allow this to happen. I love you. I want you back with me. And in order to do that, he had to wake them up. They had thought that, well, we have God, but now we have idols. So do we worship God or do we worship the idols? They were going between two things. They were double-minded. They were not single-minded. God is a jealous God. If you want to believe in God, then believe in the God, that one that created the universe, and to realize that we are created beings, and it is for our best good to follow him, to keep our eyes on him, that we might learn and live according to the, the blessings that he has given to us. So why are we looking at this idea of problems within the Laodicean church? Because he's trying to warn us. Let's go to a verse that kind of helps us with that. It's from James 1, 5 to 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But... Let him ask in faith. Faith is based upon the word of God. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of a sea driven by the wind and tossed. 
For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Who is unstable? The man who believes that there is a God in heaven. We should follow him. But he also believes, well, but we have these idols, so let's make sure that we take them with us. As God was talking to the people in Jeremiah, he said, you were taken there because you believed in two things. You believe that, yes, we need to worship God, but we also need to worship idols. It's one or the other. So why are we looking at this message of the Laodicean church? Because God wants to save us. So that brings up the title. Who does God want to save in his kingdom? Let's pray before we open our Bibles. Father in heaven, today we want to find out why you are leading these individuals that from Israel to Babylon, that they might learn the lesson of not worshiping other idols, but then you bring them back and you restore them. Help us, Lord, to understand the importance of having a single mind focused on you, in your word, that we will be blessed. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. To understand what's going on, we have to go to Revelation uh, chapter 3, verse 14. This is the message to the church of Laodicea. And what does it say? And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Anoint thine eyes with eye sap, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. As we've done in the previous several videos, let's break down this message and do the problems that God sees in the church. And this is what it looks like. I've taken the same verses. We have the beginning here. We have the ending here. Both of those are, were decreased in size. So what you can see here is that there's one, two, three, four, five problems that we need to look at. So if we were to use A, B, C, and D, that'll make it, make it easier for us to figure out where we're going to go and what we're going to do. We plan to discuss each one of these problems and kind of show their relationship with each other. So let's begin with Jesus. It's from Revelation 3.14, and it says, Unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith who? The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And then he starts out and he says, I know your works. So let's, let's look at these and let's start with the Amen. The Amen is a short term. If you use the dictionary, uh, Webster's Dictionary, 1828, it says, as a verb, it signifies to confirm, establish, or verify, or trust, or give confidence. As a noun, same thing, truth, firmness, trust, confidence. As an adjective, firm or stable. It is a word that we can say when someone gives us a truth or the sun is out or the, um, the sky is clear, you can say amen. It is a truth, okay? So when we go down to this Thayer's Greek lexicon, it was a custom which passed over from the synagogues to the Christian assemblies that 
when he, he, he who read or discoursed, that is, the one in front, had offered up a solemn prayer to God or a reading, the others responded, Amen, and thus made the substance of what was uttered their own. So when you hear a Bible scripture given up in front, you can say Amen. Not because the man said it, but because you know that it came from the Word of God, and that Word came from the one that we need to listen to. So, for examples, let's look at John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, there is that word, Amen. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He gives him a truth. Where is that truth from? From the word of God. Next one, Matthew 11, 11. Verily I say unto you, there it is again, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So here's another amen. So Jesus is talking, he's telling you, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So that's true. Uh, Matthew 28, 28. Jesus is talking and he's, he's ready to leave and he says to them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you how often? Always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Jesus said, this is true. This is going to happen. I want you to listen to my words, their commandments, do them. And then remember, I'm going to be with you forever. Beautiful promises from God. So now we're going on to the, to the next statement, the faithful and true witness. So he is faithful. We can trust in him. He is true. He's one who has seen something. So what are examples of that? Matthew 18, 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. That's how they did their legal system. That's how they believed things happened. First Thessalonians 2, 5. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covenants. God is our witness. So here Paul is talking to some people and is saying, we said this and this and this. And if you want to have a witness, ask God. He will be true. How about Revelation 11, 3? I will give thee power unto my two witnesses, okay, Revelation 11, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three score years clothed in sackcloth. Witnesses are those that have seen the things and they say, this has happened. How many do you need? You need at least two. That was another characteristic of Jesus. So let's go on. The beginning of the creation of God. All we have to do is read this, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's, he was at the beginning of creation, wasn't he? How about 1 John 1, 1? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the Word of God. So John talks about um, Jesus as being God, and then he says, we were there, we saw it, what you're reading in this book, you can believe because we saw it. Another characteristic of Jesus. So why are we considering the characteristics of Jesus? Because they are solutions for our problem in Laodicea. So what was the first one? The Amen. Everything he says can be trusted. He is the Word of God. The faithful and true witness. He is the one that is watching over us. He knows exactly what we do. We know that whatever he says about us is true. It is not what we say, it is what he sees. And the last one, the beginning of the creation of God, he is the one that is going to recreate us in terms of, will he wash our sins away with his blood? The answer is yes. Then he will fill us with his spirit. That is the recreation. It is solutions for the church of Laodicea. Okay, so now we're ready to, uh, to tackle the problems. So let's go through that. Let's look at it. The first one is in uh, verse 15. That thou art neither cold nor hot, I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art what? Luke, warm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Lukewarm is not a word that should be used for a Christian. 
We considered this idea in the introduction and found that if we do not seek God with our whole heart, 100%, we will not find him. The idea of being lukewarm is not a good one because Jesus tells us that he will get rid of us. And that's the warning. So we've already seen one problem. You cannot be double-minded. I'll serve God. I'll I'll serve uh, evil. I'll serve God. I'll serve evil. One or the other. Choose and make up your mind. Don't be double-minded. That's the idea of being lukewarm. But the problem is that Jesus also warns us that if you're lukewarm, like if I were to drink lukewarm water, I would want to get rid of it. It isn't correct. It isn't hot. It isn't cold. Jesus says, if you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. That should be enough to understand what he's trying to tell us. Let's go on to the next problem. Verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jeremiah 17.9. Why do we think that we are one way when we're actually another? It says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Whose heart is that? That's your heart. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? Are you going to trust in something that's evil, that's going to lie? That's your own heart. And you can say, well, no, I'm different. I always tell the truth. Well, that's true. But God has said something different. So going back to where we were, because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, knowest not that thou art, this is what God sees, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We have to listen to the truthful witness. What is wretchedness? It's actually a description of a man caught in the chains of sin. You've seen that. For physical problems, maybe alcohol, or cigarettes, um, drugs, things that will unbalance your body or do bad things to your body. Why do you do them? Well, because I like them. But you also do them because your body gets hooked, hooked on them. Uh, so these are problems. Stay away from them. That's wretchedness. How about miserable? It's easily defined. That man or woman is very unhappy from grief, pain, calamity, poverty, apprehension of evil, or other cause. That's from Webster's. How about poor? You don't really need a, a, a definition for that. You already know what poor is. It means you don't have currency. Isn't that, what, isn't that right? How about blind? If you have something in front of you, how can you see the future? How can you get prepared for your next step or what it is you want to do? And then the last one you already know. Naked means you don't have the right clothing. But nakedness is something different. It means that you have nothing to cover things that should be covered. What Jesus is doing with these words is that he's describing your present condition. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. These words cannot be denied because they were given by the word of God. But they do reveal the reality. What do you do when you see reality? You take care of it. You give solutions to it. As opposed to what you think your condition is, Jesus is saying, this is your condition real condition. What's interesting is that when you see this, you say, well, that can't be because I just said I'm rich. I have need of nothing. Pride blinds us to our present condition. But pride is responsible for our future placement by God. We can find the solution because of Christ. How about the next one? Verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes said that thou mayest see. What's interesting about this particular problem is that the solutions for the wretchedness, the miserableness, the poorness, the blindness, and the nakedness is offered to us by Jesus Christ because he's already told you, you're not rich, you're naked, 
and you need to be taken care of. This brings us to the situation where we see ourselves for what we are. You need to repent and surrender your hearts to God, and he will give you what you need. He will give you gold for richness, white raiment to cover your nakedness, and I salve that you might see the needs of those around you and give you wisdom to see the path of God that is before you. God is the one who does this for us if we yield ourselves to him. We need to praise God for his love and amazing wisdom. How about the next one? D, 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Is this really a problem? Not really. It's a solution, but you must take this. So it becomes a problem if you don't. The love of God is seen with the fruits of the Spirit. That's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. We love because God first loved us. To rebuke is to apply restraints that will direct the paths of those rebuked. To chasten is to teach that each action that you do, whether it's verbal or with your hands, to chasten means that this action that you're given may not be godly. It will produce a reaction that needs to be tempered by the love of Jesus Christ. We need to be awakened to a constant awareness. God is with you. Like God, we're asked to help and restrain our actions and the actions of our sons and daughters. But those actions must be filled with repentance that we might guide those around us with the love of God. Lord, help us to be like you, that we might lead others to the kingdom of heaven. How about E, the last one? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus Christ declares that he is knocking at the door of the heart of each one of us. You hear the voice, and it says, Please open the door and let me come in. I will love you and spend time with you. I will give you counsel. I will give you gold, white raiment, and I said. His promise is the truth of the gospel. What did he say in Jeremiah 31.3? The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, I have loved you, with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. That is a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ, isn't it? What is it that he promises us with the last verse, the last few verses of chapter 3? 321. To him that overcometh I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even also as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The promises are amazing, aren't they? To sit with Jesus on his throne. We need to recognize that this promise will only be fulfilled if we believe in the words of our Savior. And what words can we trust? Revelation 1, 5, and 6. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests. Unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In the very words of Revelation 1, 5, and 6, we recognize Jesus is the only one that can help us. He's the only one that can save us. And how did this all begin? He loved you. If you go to him, he will wash you of your sins. And then he says, I'm going to make you as kings and priests unto God and his Father. Jesus does not start over again and recreate you, but it is as if you died because he died on the cross and paid for our sins. He's restored us by us believing in him. That's the law of faith. 
If you believe that Jesus can save you amply, fully, and entirely, he will. Because of the things we've just mentioned, by love, by the blood, and then being made into kings and priests. So how are you made into kings and priests? By keeping your eyes on Jesus. Because that's how it's done. He shows you step by step. Let's choose him today. Let's listen to his voice that we might be saved. And he will walk with us all the way into the kingdom of heaven. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you.